what you need to know in order to catch the crooks who cook the books. We claim that we made 50% profit margin. Now, other than prostitution and drug dealing, I don't know anybody who makes 50%. FMN, sponsored by Financial Executives International and the Institute of Management Accountants. You know, Michael, Mark Morris is still in the news pretty frequently these days. Uh, well, Becky, the reason is pretty simple. Morris has the dubious distinction of having perpetrated one of the largest and most brazen financial frauds in American history. While the 1980s may seem like ancient history to many viewers, it was only 20 years ago that a carpet cleaning company called ZZZZ Best soared and crashed, leaving a twisted trail of fraud that took prosecutors, regulators, and judges years to sort out. The company was known simply as Z-Best, and the financial community was rocked when it was uncovered that 43 out of 50 million dollars of Z-Best's revenue was fake. Mark Morris, who ran the company's construction and insurance restoration division, ended up serving four and one half years in prison for creating more than 10,000 phony documents, as well as more than 300 million dollars in phony reconstruction projects. Today, every college auditing class studies the Z-Best carpet cleaning fraud. And these days, Mark Moores is out of jail teaching business ethics at Pepperdine University and lecturing to financial executives on detecting and preventing corporate fraud. In a candid interview, Moores shares his story with us, how he got involved with Z-Best, how they got away with what they did, and how it is possible to catch the crooks who are cooking the books. It's actually kind of a, a weird circuitous route. I had my own income tax practice in the late 1970s. All I did was taxes. I'm not an accountant, never taken a business class or accounting class, but I did take that H&R block, uh, how to do taxes, and I had about two or three hundred tax clients. Almost all were business owners. And one day I started raising money for a bunch of them because a lot of them had trouble getting loans and credit lines. And since I had been their tax preparer, I could go and, and talk to the banks or talk to the SNLs. That was back when the SNLs had just been deregulated uh, by Jimmy Carter. And I found that it was a lot more fun to raise money for people than to do their taxes or any other kind of services. So I sort of segued into loan brokering, if you will. And out of the blue, I get a call from a friend who says he knows this 19-year-old kid named Barry Minko, who owns the ZZZZZ Best Carpet Cleaning Company. And the kid needs money for expansion. And so I went out on a, just a cold meeting, met Barry Minko, and he said, Mark, I want to be the largest carpet cleaning company in America, and I need all the money I could ever get for it. And I said, well, let me see if I can raise you money. What basically happened was, uh, at the time I was doing that, I was charging people 5%, 5 points uh, for brokering loans for them. And most of the people I knew were, first time ever, they were happy to pay that because they'd had so much trouble getting loans before. So when I met Barry Minko, him only being 19, I'll be blunt, I thought, well, maybe I can boost a little more out of him. So I told him when he asked me, how much do you get paid for these? I said, oh, you know, seven, seven and a half points. But to prove how sharp he was, and he really was, he said, I'll pay you 10 points, but I want to be your only client. At that time, I said, well, you won't be my only client, but I said, you'll be my number one client for sure. And in time, uh, his demands and needs for money became greater and greater. I was making a fortune. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, as they say, the rest is sort of history. When I do uh, lectures and I talk about the ZBS case, it sometimes sounds like I'm taking pot shots at the accountants and the bankers and the lawyers who... Uh, who actually helped us with our crime, but they were uh, unwilling and unwitting and unknowing. And about four months into it, uh, I had believed all the work we were doing was real. So uh, one of the people I should take a big pot shot at is me. And uh, after four months, we had actually borrowed some money against a receivable. It's called factoring for the people who don't know. And uh, we paid it off. But when the person was paid off, they didn't get paid off by an insurance company like Travelers or State Farm as they expected. They got paid off by this um, uh, appraiser. And they thought that was odd. They thought maybe we had misled them. So they got a little suspicious and they decided to go look at one of our construction sites. They went to see what was supposed to be an eight-story building 
in a beach community in California that we had done restoration work on and when he got there the building didn't exist. So he had told Barry Minko that he knew that we were liars. And Barry called me into his office and he, I'll never forget it, he said, Mark, I have some bad news. And I said, what is that? And he goes, you remember the Arroyo Grande job up at that beach community? I said, sure. And he goes, well, it was a fake. I manufactured the whole thing. And at that moment he asked me, he said, Mark, do you think you could create the paperwork to make that job look like it was real, like all the other jobs? And to this day, and I really mean this, I wonder what great character flaw I have. What I wish there was something I could blame it on, like dyslexia or you know some some phobia of some sort. Uh, how quickly I decided to make false documents. I rationalized it in about 35 seconds. I said, well, look, if I do this, we'll have a successful IPO, which was in the works already. We'll get about 10 to 15 million dollars, and it'll be the only bad thing I ever do. And what the heck? I believe this job was real. Everybody else believed it was real. The job is over. So all I'm doing is creating paperwork to kind of make it look like the rest of it. And then about two weeks after that, Barry called me in his office and said, I have more bad news. And I said, please don't tell me you made up another fake job. He said, okay, I won't tell you that. He goes, what I'll tell you is they're all fake. There's never been a real job. They're all bogus. And at that moment, I made, w without a doubt, the worst decision of my life, which was I said, well, to use the vernacular, I said, well, I'm already in bed with you. I guess I got to stay. And so I set about then creating thousands and thousands of documents. Uh, Barry had said, as soon as we get our public offering, we'll pay off everybody we owe money to, and we'll just stop doing insurance restoration and construction jobs, and we'll just grow the, the real company. So it was, it was a pretty straightforward rationalization. No doubt, it was a rationalization, and I was wrong. But it was pretty straightforward. I kind of thought, well, what the heck? We're 90% there. We're going to be totally legitimate, so let's go ahead and do it. Obviously, that didn't happen. What's so ironic about the Z-Best story is that one of our downfalls, the journalist discovered that we didn't have a contractor's license number. And when she was told by the Secretary of State of California that, that that's impossible, that if we don't have one, we have to be a fraud, that was the first domino of her domino effect of proving that we were uh, a fraudulent company. But what's more fascinating than that she was just a journalist doing her job, asking questions. She had no agenda. She had no idea we were fraudulent. But she just did her job, asked a bunch of questions, and, and an answer popped out that didn't fit. What's far more important is that over 100 CPAs, more than 40 lawyers, and probably 50 or 60 bankers, all looked at the same documents that didn't have contractors' license numbers on them. All knew that we had claimed to do 100 jobs at an average of over three million dollars each, over three hundred million dollars worth of construction work. And no one ever once asked, do you get licenses? Are you bonded? What's your contractor's license number? Do you, ever, do you have all your permits, etc.? No one ever asked those questions. There's something that's in very short supply, and that's common sense. And today more than ever, much more so than in 1987. In 1987, when the Z-Best crime happened, accountants could brag about the clever ways they were getting around the tax code. They didn't have to fear being looked at askance or having people look down them. Today, if you said, I've got a great idea for my corporation to avoid taxes, they'd want to run you out of town, even though it's totally legal. Avoiding taxes, not, here's what's funny, avoiding taxes is not only legal, it's mandatory. If I, as an accountant, don't take every tax deduction I can find to lower your tax bill, you could sue me for malpractice. So we've got people like Stanley Tools, just a few months ago, wanted to move to Bermuda or Caymans or something uh, to save money and avoid taxes. And yet the New York Times wrote an article saying Stanley Tools is moving to Bermuda to, uh, to evade taxes, and they never wrote a retraction on that. When a big paper like that, of course, with what's going on with the Times lately, it's not quite the shock. But when they, they, they write that word and think that you can write the word avoid and evade as if they were the same word. And more importantly, the public looking down at Stanley Tools. How dare you try to save money? Well, last month Stanley laid off like a thousand workers. Um, you know, the piper's got to get paid in one way or another. And uh, I think that that is something that business people have to worry about more than ever before, is the stu does stuff pass the sniff test? And so in 1987, people should have said, Z-Best doesn't pass the smell test. Something's wrong. Something, 
they're doing something that is impossible. They're in a, a single di profit, single digit profit kind of business. It's a no brainer business. They don't have some special patent or some magical formula that's going to allow them to make outrageous profits. They hammer nails into wood and screw screws in and put in lighting fixtures. There's no way they can make a 50% profit. So I have to keep asking questions until I either bust them or find out how it is that they do it. Today, that would be even more so because today you've got uh, people that are a lot more savvy going, how could you let this happen? And and that's the way that's the way it's been, and that's why I think now more than ever, I think the extra scrutiny, I think uh, thinking, asking the right questions is more important now than ever before. As I've said before, I'm not protecting anyone. There were no other co-conspirators. None of the accountants, lawyers, or bankers knew what was going on. Um, were they all greedy? Of course. Would any accountant want to say, I'm responsible for ZBest firing us? Of course not. Um, but I don't think anybody looked up and said, I really see something that's terribly wrong, but I'm just going to not rock the boat. I think it was more along the lines of, if this was an important question, somebody else somewhere would have already asked it. And as far as making up the documents go, and as far as, 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 as fooling the people, I think what, what has to be realized is the longer a fraud goes on, in many cases, the easier it gets. Because the hardest part of a fraud is getting people to believe that first layer of really stupid lies like the 50% profit margins, like the, uh, the way we did business. Once they accepted it, then it's just standard operating procedures. Then you just keep on going. And if anybody ever does slip up and ask you a question, you say, oh, that was handled two years ago when you did the first audit for us. And then, poof, the problem immediately goes away. What's totally ironic about this case is we're talking about the top legal firms, the top uh, law firms, the top bankers, the top accounting firms. We had a big eight accountant. Our lawyer was one of the largest Wall Street lawyers. All of those companies had uh, professionals looking at our paperwork who were fooled by it. What is important to remember is almost always for a fraud to be able to be pulled off, there has to be a tremendous amount of reality. Enron really did $335 billion worth of trades one year. And that reality shielded a lot of the fakery. At ZBest, we had hundreds and hundreds of employees driving all over Southern California, cleaning carpets, making TV commercials, honoring coupons. People saw our vans around. There was a reality there. And snuck into all of the real paperwork would be one of my false documents, and then maybe another one a day or two later. Certainly, if anybody ever sat down and looked at them in total, they'd go, oh, this is just a big pile of nonsense. But you sneak in the fakery and then cross your fingers and hope it works. It is easy to sit back and say, look, Mark fooled a bunch of, you know, bumpkins. We fooled the top of the line.